so it's a great, great pleasure to have with me today, Mr. Audrey Tang. You are the Digital Minister of Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Hello. Hello. Um, so we will be talking a bit about uh, the Corona crisis, which our two countries have faced with quite differently. My name is Marcus Carlson, by the way. I am a mathematician and I have gotten involved in the Swedish debate about uh, different strategies about uh, how to deal with coronavirus. And we shall, of course, also talk about uh, governance in general and maybe what we in Sweden can learn from Taiwan. Okay. And of course, if you have questions for me, I'm more than happy to answer uh, in the manner that I can. But if we start with Corona crisis, so I think many people in Sweden are unaware. Um, Taiwan is a country with 23 million people. Mm -hmm. And as I understand it, you have seven deaths in Yeah, COVID it's been more than 100 days since we have a locally confirmed case. So we're firmly post pandemic now and uh, well into the stimulus phase. And did you ever close schools or? No, uh, we have imposed no lockdown and no takedowns either uh, for the infodemic part, which we may get to later. But no, there was no lockdowns. Our schools um, took two weeks uh, to gather uh, the necessary equipments, such as thermometers, um, of course, hand sanitizers, masks and so on. Uh, so the school um, semester was moved um, two weeks uh, later, uh, but so the summer vacation begins in uh, July 15 instead of July 1st. But otherwise, no, we have had not closed um, any schools uh, and most businesses remain open too. But this is fantastic and I think a bit of a, a, a shock to many Swedish people because here the discussion has been a lot about um, you can't stop this pandemic because stopping it would require uh, closing schools, uh, the economy will suffer so heavily and simply at the end of the day you create more problems for your country by trying to stop the pandemic than somehow just let it, I mean here the emphasis has been on keeping the spread at the rate so that the health system doesn't collapse. I think that that's of that course very important. Right. Yeah, we prioritize, for example, ensuring we have plenty of the uh, so-called uh, negative pressure uh, wars and uh, uh, people who are uh, deemed essential health workers for a while were um, discouraged from going to vacation overseas and we pay them, of course, extra pay and stipend and so on to keep them uh, within uh, Taiwan so that we have sufficient capacity. Of course, capacity is the most important thing to think of. Right. But still, so you have chosen a, a, a radically different path because you never had a wide community spread in Taiwan. That, that's exactly right. We have isolated uh, community transmission, but in each of those cases, the transmission chain is fully contact traced. Uh, and that, uh, in addition to the quarantine at the borders, uh, led to zero community spread. Zero community spread. And, but do, do you have a big exchange with mainland China? I mean, is there a we lot did. of we, we did, we did. And that's why uh, the first day of January, we started health inspections for all flights coming in from Wuhan to Taiwan. And that's, I think, 10 days earlier than uh, almost everybody else. Uh, and so starting early is important. We acted on the social media signal, a, a whistleblower called Dr. Li Wenliang uh, in Wuhan uh, said in social media, there's seven new confirmed SARS cases, even though he would get quote, harmonize, unquote, uh, locally for a while. Um, in Taiwan, uh, it's escalated to our medical officer within 24 hours, and we acted very early on. Wow. So what would you say are the key? OK, so you, you were early, mm -hmm. acted fast, and I guess this, this mm -hmm. is key. But yeah, uh -huh. so it, 
yeah, but but that's not enough. Uh, so fast, uh, of course, gets you um, earlier in the curve. But as long as the R value is above one, uh, fast can only do so much. Uh, and so, of course, uh, advanced uh, deployment, like setting up the Central Epidemic Command Center, which holds daily live press conferences uh, every day, every uh, 2 p.m., is very important. But the uh, uh, hard thing to do is to make sure that people see that there is a fair distribution of uh, personal protective equipment, namely medical masks. So in Taiwan, uh, we built a mask production from 2 million a day to 20 million a day uh, within a short uh, order, like within a couple of months. And everybody can see uh, using a civic uh, technologist uh, imagination is called a mask availability map. Everybody can see which pharmacies near them have how many adult and how many children's masks in stock. And you can take your national health insurance card, go in there and collect uh, nine if you're an adult every two weeks or 10 if you are a child. And this ensure that more than 90% of population gained access to medical masks. The other uh, less than 10% perhaps already have some masks in stock. Um, and so all in all, uh, this created a sub one R value because people understood the importance of washing their hands properly using soap or hand sanitizers because we build mask as something that protects myself from my own washed hand. And this is very important because it connects strongly mask use with soap use. Um, and then uh, the R value become under one even before we introduced physical distancing rules. And of course, it became even lower after the physical distancing rules. Wow, this is amazing. Um, so in Sweden, we also have pre press conferences every day at two, but I think the only common denominator is uh, the recommendation to wash hands. We, we had that here as well. Mm -hmm. um, beyond that, we are still not using masks. Mm -hmm. and our authorities are reluctant to use masks because they claim it's not scientifically proven to work. To, to protect uh, you from your own hand? Of course, it's scientifically proven that if you wear a mask, you don't touch your own mouth. I, I mean, uh, you probably mean that it's not scientifically proven that if the other people do not wear a mask and only I wear a mask, whether it actually protects me from them. But our idea was never about protecting myself from them. It's about protecting me from myself. And that, of course, is scientifically sound. Yes, no, I, I, I believe that. I'm just, um, and I will not go into argument with. No, with, I, I'm not arguing. I'm just citing uh, different incentives. Right. No, but, but here it's really uh, the main idea communicated to the people is that it's not clear if masks will reduce the R value if everybody uh, wears them. So, the recommendations here are wash your hands, um, but they do not acknowledge asymptomatic spread. So if one family member is sick in COVID-19 and another family member is not sick, then that person goes to work. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I mean, I mean, uh, if there were no culture of wearing mask, uh, I can see it may be uh, prudent to connect strongly mask to soap uh, hand washing to physical distance before uh, requiring people to wear mask on public transport. For a couple of days, we were ourselves deliberating that because we don't want people to wear a mask and get into a false sense of security and forget to wash their hands and keep social distance. And so the main idea, I think, is that we wrote out a series of very funny memes uh, that associates strongly uh, mask use uh, with um, hand washing. And this includes from the spokes dog of the ministries of health and welfare to say, uh, use soap, wash your hands, wear a mask to protect you from doing this. Um, which is putting your hands to your mouth uh, and uh, cover uh, when you're uh, sneezing and things like that. Uh, and when you're indoor, keep three dogs away from each other. And when you're outdoor, keep two dogs away. Uh, and so I, I agree without these, 
mask use could be detrimental. But we wrote this out very quickly, uh, like in February. Um, and so mask use uh, was not a concern after people understand the basic epidemiology. Okay. And you also do uh, contact tracing. Of course. Of course. And so here now, primarily thanks to summer, we believe, because Sweden somehow stops in summer and everybody goes to their summer cabin. Uh, not everybody, but many people, a large part. Uh, so I'm actually sitting in my summer cabin here now. So our numbers are down. We are still, I forgot the exact figure, but maybe even 100 times more than neighboring countries who, who did a lockdown and now is, is following a, a similar strategy to yours. But compared to what it was, we are down. And the recommendation now here is that people should contact trace themselves. So it's not the responsibility of the doctor to contact trace, but it's the responsibility of the individual to call up people he might have infected. Um, uh, any comments on that or how in, do you do in, it? In well, in, in Taiwan, we do both, right? We, we expect people who are confirmed uh, to uh, remember uh, who they have uh, contacted in the past 14 days. Uh, that, of course, helps. And of course, it, it's coming from them. It's more convincing. Uh, but we also do quarantine uh, in uh, the airports and seaports when people go back to Taiwan it's 14 days quarantine either in a quarantine hotel uh, or through the digital fence quarantining at home uh, and so the main idea is through quarantining uh, and not through uh, people voluntarily um, agreeing to quarantine we, we enforce quarantine uh, during the quarantine we pay you 33 US dollars a day as a stipend for your work. But if you break out of the quarantine, you pay us a thousand times that. You can support 1,000 people in quarantine uh, by breaking the quarantine, I'm sure. Uh, and so um, there is a strong incentive for people to comply with the quarantining rules. And so it's a rational choice. Uh, so I, th I guess the fine, the large sum of fine, uh, ensures that people uh, understand the rules and work with the rules. Yeah, you mentioned 14 days, and that's something which have been mentioned here in Sweden um, by, let's say, opponents of harsher measures, that if, if a large part of the population has to isolate for 14 days, it's too much. It, it will destroy the economy, the works will not function, and so on. Um, but I guess if you do it early on, then you, you, the amount of people who have to quarantine is actually very, very small. That's right, that's right. It's in the tens of thousands, which is a large amount, but it, it beats community transmission. Right. Um, so Taiwan is an island, and, and so is New Zealand, which is another example of, of a nation which has successfully... Mm -hmm. uh, mm, uh, eliminated, uh, yes. Uh-huh. Um, and one argument which I've heard here in the Swedish debate is that, yes, but these are islands. So this is sort of the luxury of island nations to be able to beat the pandemic in this way because they have, they can control the borders due to being an island. Um, any comments on, on that? Well, in Sweden's case, um, I'm not sure that you have problems controlling your borders. I mean, you, you only border with, what, three countries? Uh, so, you're right. <laughs> that, that's Norway, Finland, and, and Denmark, if that counts, uh, right? Uh, and so um, I don't think it really is that big a problem, um, even if you're a non-island. Uh, I think the main thing is whether uh, you're willing to accept this mandatory 14-day uh, quarantining. Um, if uh, you do that, then um, I'm sure that uh, the other neighboring countries wouldn't object uh, to Sweden imposing 14-day quarantines. Um, so, so that's, the, that's the, the main reading. Of course, being an island helps, but I think even for non-islandic uh, countries, if they get uh, scientific arguments across to their neighboring countries, I'm sure that something can be set up. 
Yeah, I, I guess it boils down to numbers. So clearly you can do this, but I, I think the idea is that there's a much bigger flow of traffic when, when you have like land borders. But do you know on the top of your head, how, how what's the influx and outflux of travelers to and from Taiwan? Uh, Before the pandemic? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, um, so uh, within a, de a year, I think it's uh, around inbound is more than uh, 10, 10 million uh, people uh, a year, right? So, so it's not okay. it's not a small number. Uh, and of course, uh, now that we have Im imposed uh, very strict quarantining rules and so on, uh, during the pandemic, of course, there were days uh, of like less than 1,000 uh, each day flying in to Taiwan because people who don't uh, find 14-day quarantine attractive, they will switch to telepresence, video conference, and things like that. And, and has it stabilized now at some level? I mean, would you say are you at half the volume than before the pandemic or a tenth or? Mm, well, uh, since we are still uh, maintaining the same uh, quarantining rules, uh, we are basically only allowing uh, citizens to return uh, and then uh, also necessary business travels, but virtually no tourism. Uh, and so I would say that we are a fraction uh, of the incoming flow uh, compared to pre-pandemic. I see. And uh, for how long or how sustainable is this strategy? I mean, can you keep on, for how long can you keep on, on doing this? But well, there's uh, a standard answer, right? Until there is a vaccine. Mm. Yeah, so we are now uh, at, I think, thousands um, of um, inbound and outbound combined, thousands um, every day, uh, which is, uh, as I said, a, a fraction of uh, what we used to, to look at uh, previously. It's easily a um, 100 times that. So we're down to like less than 1% uh, of the traffic flow as compared to pre-COVID. Um, how sustainable is it? Well, we are pretty safe uh, when it comes to agricultural uh, and um, tourism. We have a lot of domestic tourism. Taiwan um, is, of course, uh, maintaining a very stable supply uh, of ICT, hardware manufacturing, smart machinery, uh, which are, of course, uh, not banned uh, to travel because they are not human beings. Uh, and so our economy remains strong. We have a positive GDP growth um, this quarter, uh, which um, I think not many countries can say that. Uh, and so uh, the idea is that our economy actually somehow benefited, uh, especially in the production and industry uh, because of COVID, because many of uh, other uh, manufacturing centers were hurt uh, by the lockdowns, but we never had a lockdown. So uh, people can um, you know, order more products uh, delivered from Taiwan and made in Taiwan. Uh, and so because of that, I think the economy is strong, uh, our stock, uh, exchanges at very high point, actually higher than pre-COVID. Uh, and so uh, we're, we're looking at uh, indefinitely continuing this policy until a vaccine is made available. And, and how is life inside Taiwan, like for a normal citizen? Do yeah, it's, 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 yeah it's, it's normal. It's normal. Um, you, you, I, I walk to work. Uh, we relaxed the uh, um, uh, gathering, uh, mass gathering rules already, uh, so people can just gather together, watch movies, hold concerts. Uh, we've been doing professional baseball for quite a while now. For a while, the only place doing professional baseball in the world. We held our LGBT pride physically, uh, and and so life is normal. We are firmly post-COVID, but of course, we still keep the mask uh, with us. And if we're in a crowded space where we cannot keep physical distance, we wear a mask to remind each other to wash our hands. Okay. Um... That's my, my father yeah. in the background. Where sure, the sure. Yeah, we, we are all getting more intimate with each other with those Skype conferences. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, another point is that the temperature checks 
uh, and uh, leaving your contact details uh, in case there's an outbreak, uh, and uh, alcohol uh, hand sniff sprays. These are still compulsory. Uh, so when you enter a public building, for example, all these are put into action. Okay, so you do temperature check. Uh -huh. uh, Before entering a building. Okay, okay, very interesting. And uh, so, so you are the digital minister That's right. of Taiwan. Yes. And I don't think we have a digital minister in Sweden. Um, what? Uh, but I, I understood. Um, or okay, let me put the question like this: How can digital tools be used um, partially to fight the pandemic and in general to to have a more active democracy, which I understand is is somehow uh, part of your role as a minister in in Taiwan. Yes. Um, so uh, for the COVID part, um, of course, the mask availability map, the pre-ordering system for masks um, is very important so that people can see uh, with their own uh, devices and their preferred mode of access, uh, not only map, but also voice assistance, chatbots and so on, um, and confirm for themselves that uh, the uh, mask production is indeed ramping up. They can um, call 1922 and say that uh, there's an oversupply or undersupply, um, and that the daily press conferences, uh, for example, when a boy call, called 1922 saying that he doesn't go want to go to school because his schoolmates may bully him because he only have pink medical mask. Because when we ration, you don't get to pick the color. The very next day in a press conference, everybody wore pink medical mask and suddenly the boy is the most hip boy because only he has the color that the heroes wear. Um, and so all this um, collective intelligence system are of course what digital can help. And based on analysis, we see that there's um, around 20% of people who never went to pharmacy to get a mask because they work long hours and after they get off work, the pharmacy is closed. And so we started working with convenience stores uh, and our premier, Su Zhen Chang, smiling happily here, uh, signifies that it, you can collect your mask now 24 hours a day. Digital can also help on the humor part. I shared uh, this folks dog. Um, of the CECC, but our premier is also our spokesperson. When there's panic buying, for example, of tissue papers, uh, there was a conspiracy theory spreading online, traveling an outrage saying that the, uh, the government have um, confiscated the tissue paper producers and forcing them to make masks. Uh, they're of the same material, so says the conspiracy theory, and we will soon run out of tissue paper. So people went out and buy in panic buying. But very quickly, we roll out this meme, this internet picture with our premier wiggling his butt a little bit and then saying mm -hmm. in large font, each of us have only one pair of Botox, uh, saying that um, there's no need to stockpile is a wordplay because stockpile and uh, butt sounds the same in Mandarin. Twin. Uh, oh, and, and, right, and there's a table here that says, uh, the tissue paper came from South American material and medical masks from domestic material. So producing one doesn't hurt the production of the other. And this was hilarious. I mean, you laughed. And so people who laughed about it is um, physically unable to feel outrage at the same time uh, about the same subject. So that is to say it's a vaccination. When people laughed about something, they can't feel outrage and they can't take uh, a, a part into the spreading of the conspiracy theory. So as long as we have the R value of our funny humor uh, messages over one and spread faster than the rumor, the rumor would die down uh, just like herd immunity. Uh, I guess we can call it nerd immunity. Uh, and then <laughs> this nerd immunity ensure that uh, people feel calm and collected even during a, a pandemic. So that's also how digital can help. You can read a lot about it at TaiwanCanHelp.us. Okay, I will for sure do that. Very interesting. I read a bit about um, your work with, uh, with more active democracy, let's oh, yeah. say, and and also how to um, encourage servicemen at different levels to yes. engage yes. In, instead of having like a top-down organization right. at the bottom side. Something. Yeah, I'm a horizontal ministry. That's right. 
Yeah, so for example, when we first uh, tackled Uber, uh, when Uber first came to Taiwan, they worked with people with no professional driver licenses in 2015. And so uh, we used this POLIS tool, which is an open source tool uh, that uh, enable people to reflect on each other's positions. So this avatar may be you, and then you see a statement. For example, I think uh, insurance for the passengers are very important. Uh, it, and you can click agree or disagree. And as you do, you will move toward people who feel similar to you. So it's a uh, dimensional reduction of the multi-dimension, like each question is one dimension um, matrix and uh, uh, responses are people contributed, meaning that you can also enter your own feelings for other people to upvote or downvote. And the clusters uh, drawn by k-means clustering uh, show what people feel uh, the most alike and the most apart. And so every time we run such a consultation, the system automatically say that there's maybe five things that are ideological that people uh, see as controversial. But actually, most people agree on most things uh, with, with most of their neighbors most of the time. And these are rough consensus, even though they get less media uh, time, of course, uh, because they're not controversial. Uh, but the point is that every time we run a consultation well, without a reply button, <laughs> uh, you can always see the trolls lose interest because there's no reply button. And we always get something that people can broadly agree on. And so we use this consultation not only for Uber, but also for, for example, uh, the co-hack the coronavirus hackathon, uh, where we ask people around many different countries, what are the norms that you feel um, as acceptable uh, to develop technologies on in uh, six different broad categories of uh, issues such as supporting frontline workers uh, and doing a good allocation of resources, making a smooth transition to a post-COVID normal and things like that. And so there are controversial points. For example, there's an American uh, who point, uh, posted that we should develop a um, uh, AI at the ICU, instead of treating the people who come first or are the most severe, we need to calculate their remaining contribution to the society and only treat uh, the people who have a higher remaining value to the society. Uh, and that is, by the way, um, illegal in Taiwan and not at all agreed as the norm uh, by the Asian folks. Uh, in any case, the point is that instead of wasting time on debating those controversial points, we find the parts that everybody can agree on. For example, we need to have a personal diary on our phone that records our whereabouts but do not transmit it anywhere. And when the contact tracer comes, you can generate this one-time link for the contact tracer to work with without revealing your uh, family's and friends' personal details as you would during a, a traditional contact tracing interview. Now, that's an idea that everybody can agree on. So it's a quick way to find this rough consensus, uh, the feeling part of the society, uh, before we develop the solutions. Wow, this is this is so fascinating to talk to you. And, I, and I'm a mathematician, so, so we could uh, you know dive into to, uh, that, but I, I, I will avoid that. Uh, now I have so many different questions, so I'm, I'm even confused which way to go. But um, let me focus on on what you we were talking before about masks, and that uh, in Taiwan masks were equally distributed That's right. to the whole mm -hmm. country. In Sweden, the original response to the pandemic was very much guided by a lack of um, uh, tools or equipment. Yes. So due to new management rules from the 90s, they had dismantled a lot of like in the old style governance of Sweden, we had big uh, stocks of, you know, masks and we had 50 field hospitals and so on. Um, but this was expensive to keep, so we gave it away. Most of the field hospitals went to Africa. And then when the pandemic hit, we didn't have much or, or hardly anything. Um, but what this pandemic has shown in Sweden is also um, a, a sort of paralyzation of the state machine because there were many private initiatives by people who have companies or so on, trying to connect to authorities saying, okay, I can find these masks for you, let's say within fast and in large numbers. 
and they were not picked up on. One uh, one who was uh, importer of masks, he, he said, you know, he needed an answer fast, and the government official told him uh, that he has to fill out a form and wait for two weeks. And he said, I, I cannot wait for two weeks. This, uh, you know, I, then the, the deal is no longer in two weeks. So this has shown a sort of paralysation where, and I, I think, my take on it is this, if you're a serv civil servant at some mid-level, yes, and you take personal initiative to, let's say, okay, you say, you go a bit outside the protocol and you say, okay, buy that because we need these masks. Then you can get punished if things are not... Uh... Yeah, we, we, we have that uh, very early on. Uh, we were uh, buying those... Um... Uh, mask uh, pr production parts uh, like the supersonic um, part that makes the masks. Uh, and so, um, but what, what we're doing uh, instead of importing masks, uh, we're making sure that we retain the capacity of producing masks. So what we procure uh, was machine parts, uh, not masks themselves. Um, but of course, it was a uh, procurement outside of uh, procurement rules. Uh, and so our Minister of uh, Economy, now our uh, Vice Premier, uh, Shen Rongjin, uh, as well as his deputy, now our Ministry of uh, Minister of Economy Affairs, uh, Wang Meihua, and also the then uh, Vice uh, Premier, uh, Chen Ximai, they collectively took upon themselves uh, to sign those um, um, extra um, uh, normal uh, procurement rules so that when uh, the judiciary or the corrective, uh, the, the uh, examiners uh, came to uh, hold them to account, at least people in the middle management uh, positions would not um, get uh, um, reprimanded uh, because it's um, the ministers and the uh, vice premier as orders. Uh, and so, but it was, I'm sure, flagged by mid level uh, civil servants, but it was absorbed, the political risk was absorbed by the top management uh, almost instantly. Okay. Yeah. So, 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 what I'm getting at here is that for a civil servant at some mid level to do nothing is often the safer choice for yourself, for your own. Career. If you do nothing, you did nothing wrong. If you do something, you can later get blamed for that. And um, yeah, but that's uh, minister's job. A minister's job is to absorb the risk. Right. So, so how do you encourage initiative, like civil yeah, service? By, by, by saying if you uh, innovate and you do something right you get the credit. If you innovate and you get something wrong, it's my fault. That's that's my way of working with public service. Fantastic. Um, on the topic of, uh, okay, so you, you were also talking before of uh, how you use digital tools for the, to help with the contact tracing, right? Yes. So I guess this, everybody who has a mobile phone today, the mobile phone checks where you are, and, and so if one is sick, then you can contact trace somehow by just checking physically where where the person has been. Um, this is not used in Sweden, and the main argument against it is uh, privacy or integrity, that this could somehow be misused by government or, or, or you know, sold maybe information about your private um, Life. What, what, what's your comment on that? I mean, is, is it like this, or are the ways around? We we have not introduced uh, any GPS collecting um, apps for COVID management from the government, specifically because uh, of the same privacy concerns. Uh, and uh, there's a saying, right? Anything that's introduced when I'm born, uh, that's already there when I'm born, is human nature. Uh, and anything invented after I'm born is technology. Uh, and so to paraphrase that, we can say anything 
uh, that we have deployed as a government before the pandemic is normal. And anything that's invented after the pandemic um, is technology uh, to, uh, that people don't necessarily trust. And so our toolkit is to repurpose what we already had deployed because Taiwan has earthquake all the time and also typhoon and heavy flood. Uh, we have the system uh, that automatically sends uh, short messages, SMS or so uh, broadcasting to uh, a, a fence, a geofenced uh, area. So that, for example, when there's earthquake, there was one last night, uh, people in the earthquake affected area uh, would receive a quick message even before the earthquake is felt. Uh, and so people already uh, are familiar with this. And it's based on cell phone tower triangulation. It doesn't use GPS. It just says uh, if those three cell phone towers um, draw three circles and they intersect to find my phone within around a 50 meter uh, arrow margin uh, in urban areas. And if this is within the earthquakes affected zone, then I get an SMS automatically. So it doesn't require me to install an app or anything like that. And so the digital fence that is the quarantining use the same system but uh, now it's you and also the police and also your community managers receiving a SMS if you break out of your 50 meter, uh, 50 meter radius quarantine. So it's seen as more privacy preserving because we do not know, unlike GPS, we do not know which room you are in and we only track you for 14 days since you return home. After the 14th day, there really is no constitutional basis for us to keep doing this anymore. And so it's seen as a narrow, deep, but very transparent, accountable, and understandable uh, way of uh, trading off uh, the privacy. And if you really don't like your phone being monitored, you can always go to a physical quarantine hotel, in which case you're physically barred from leaving for 14 days. And we still pay you a stipend. Okay, but okay, so let me get this straight. So you are not using then um, phones in order to actively contact trace in case you have a case inside of the country, you, you do not follow his whereabouts uh, to find other people he might have met or so. That's right, that's right. Not as a rule. Uh, there are exceptions, for example, if you are on an important business trip uh, and you come from a relatively mild country, uh, then you can shorten your 14 day quarantine to five days. But the remaining nine days, uh, you have to be on fixed itinerary. That is to say, you have to say where you are going and take a cab, not uh, public transport. And the cab is, of course, uh, with the uh, shielding and so on. And so in which case, the digital fence extends to the place that you're visiting. Uh, so that uh, could also be configured, but uh, that's um, more exceptional, just a few cases. But as a rule, yeah, it's static, uh, just in the place you're quarantining, yeah. Okay, um, switching focus a bit. So, so your work is much about uh, finding consensus, uh, governing in a way that somehow resonates with, yes. with the people. Yes. Uh, he there's been a, a lot of debate about the schools. Well, in Sweden, we have a wide community spread. Now, I, I don't have the latest figures now, but um, it, we're for sure above a few hundred new cases every day. So the, the disease is out there. It's fizzling around. It's not as bad as it was, but, but it's there and it gets um, you know, into schools. We had a teacher who, who, who died. And... Um, so some parents are very happy about schools being open because it means uh, it's difficult to be home for a long time with your children. Mm -hmm. um, well, other parents, especially parents who are maybe in a risk group, who are at high risk of, of dying from COVID, uh, the, the controversy there was that they are forced to send their kids to school. So they are not given the choice of homeschooling their, their uh, kids until the pandemic is over, meaning that the government comes in and says, if you send the kids to school and accept the risk, or there will be some, some uh, fine, or, or even uh, social authorities can come and make some investigation. Um, I'm just curious, of how, how does that sound in, in your ears? I mean, how, how would Taiwanese people react if this was was Taiwan. 
Well, I guess they will first ask, as was the case when we first um, basically postponed reopening of schools, um, they will ask, are there temperature checkers uh, in every classroom? Are there sufficient amount of masks? And uh, are the children uh, being taught to wash their hands with soap very thoroughly uh, and keeping physical distance? Um, and if all the four requirements are met, it's generally seen as safe because, well, scientific evidence shows that if you do all four measures together, the R value is under one. Uh, but if you if you do not have all four measures in place, of course, it could be placing people in risk. Yes. And what would be the Taiwanese, I mean, sentiment about such a, let's say, so you don't have the mask, you don't have the temperature checks, and you're forced to send your kids to school. Well, then people would argue that we should postpone the opening of schools until all schools have those prerequisite uh, components. Yeah, I guess that's a, that's a logical... Uh... <laughs> yeah, well, it's the logical a response from the scientific evidence. I mean, this is not about sentiment. This is about risk uh, calculation. Yeah, but, but uh, you said something that scientific evidence is a word which is very common in the Swedish debate. But here it is more like, you know, so, so, so there are different levels of scientific evidence. For example, about, you know, face masks. Um, you, 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 there haven't been any, how do you call it, randomized control trials, you know, where you take one group, select them, and, and they don't have the mask. And then, the, I mean, so there's a lot of evidence that face masks work, but we don't have this highest level of scientific uh, evidence yet, at least, uh, in, in, in what's been proven. And then the Swedish authorities take on this is that, okay, it's not 100% proven that masks work. Well, in uh, you mean in social <laughs> settings, right? Because there are publications in medical settings, and these are RCTs. Right, but here they're saying that these publications are not uh, as strong and if you use it in public then maybe it has some negative consequences also so um, I'm just telling you what the de debate is so basically what they're saying is we don't have a hundred percent proof that masks work therefore we shall not use them because we are evidence-based Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, there are RCTs in medical uh, settings. I agree there's not as much RCTs in non-medical settings, but uh, there really shouldn't be a difference. I mean, uh, if people understand the epidemiology behind it, that is to say, if people wash their hands as a medical worker or nurse would, uh, then obviously the mask would have the same effect as medical workers or nurses. I, I mean, this is just common sense. So, I think it boils down to a sociological argument that if people could not be trusted to use their masks properly, then I agree, mask may not have its indented effect. But in Taiwan, we see that as a challenge and say, OK, so we now have to work on the digital memes, those limericks, lyrics, whatever, to make sure that people understand to properly use the mask. First, wash your hands properly with soap, otherwise the mask is of no use, and so on. Uh, and so making sure that everybody understands the science behind it, in which case it gets into the territory of the RCT proven evidence-based uh, mask uh, efficacy. Right. So RCT is randomized control trial. Yeah, it's a yes. scientific method of, mm -hmm. of checking things. I'm just filling in maybe for yeah. mm -hmm. scientific listeners here. Um, Right. Um, right. So, so in Taiwan, you trust the people to do the right thing. You educate yes. them and you, yes. you give them responsibility yes. to, to follow these guidelines. That sounds very similar to Sweden. It's just that the guidelines are diametrically opposite. So that's what the Swedish officials also say. We trust people to do the right thing. But they are probably not, they're not capable of using the mask properly. So we omit that. And, uh, yeah, so, so it's, it's a logical argument both way, 
right? When one side doesn't disprove the other, it's based on a very different assumption of how people behave. That's the main difference. Mm. And it's uh, what we call the the, uh, the Pygmalion effect, right? Okay. Yeah, the, the Pygmalion effect uh, or the Rosenthal effect is a psychological phenomenon. I'm just quoting Wikipedia, wherein if you have high expectations of someone, that someone will improve their performance. And if you have a low expectation of that someone, that person will have a lower performance. So in either case, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm. <laughs> Fascinating. Um, I'm also thinking of, about the um, my, my, my final point here, I, I guess we're, we're, we're reaching the hour. Um, so, I'm, I'm thinking of this from uh, different strategies of dealing with the pandemic, um, from an equality or maybe discrimination perspective. Um, so, so, so you are a transgender woman, as I understand. Yes. This, this is probably then something you also have um, thought about, I guess, in, or, or encountered in life. Um, in Taiwan, with your strategy, different groups of society, the old, the high risk mm -hmm. group, the children, mm -hmm. they do equal effort to keep everybody else safe, right? So uh, that's right, but we also restrict uh, visits to long-term care facilities uh, until uh, May, I think, uh, and uh, also limit the number of people who can get to uh, their um, family members uh, when they were hospitalized, the people who go to visit them uh, were also restricted uh, in number. And so um, we make sure to protect the medical workers uh, and people who are nurses in those long term uh, health care centers and so on. Uh, and these were our priorities. So, yes, everybody do their part, of course, but the medical and nurse uh, workers are still the, the most essential to be protected. Yeah, you mentioned old homes or old care facilities, uh, mm -hmm. was it completely prohibited to visit your uh, elderly relatives or? For, 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 a few, for a few months, it was uh, it was restricted to video only. Okay, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So this is the same here. So what we see in Sweden now is the numbers are down a lot and, and indeed it has gone down faster than many of the epidemiologic, epidemiological models uh, predicted, uh, which we are still struggling to, to understand a bit why our antibody levels do not resonate with, with, uh, with the epidemic dying out. But it's believed that a large, so we still have community spread, but very relatively few people die. We still have deaths. Uh, I don't have the latest figures, but uh, some weeks back it was 20 persons per day that died from mm. COVID-19. And this is considered very positive in Sweden because we, we were up at much higher. Uh, in, in the peak, it was 100 cases per day. So there's this uh, somehow dichotomy here. So on one hand, we have community spread, but on the other hand, the death toll goes down. And it's believed that this is because uh, basically the older generation and those at risk group are self-isolating. Which means that you take the elderly population and the risk group and basically they are not able to live a normal life until there is a vaccine so that the rest of the people, the, the younger and middle aged, can have a more or less normal life until there is a vaccine. So, so there's a big difference if, in which group you are in Sweden. If you're young and healthy, you go on as normal. If you're old or fragile, 
you're even scared of going to 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 do your shopping, right? So, yeah. I, I, um, what do you think of this from an equality or discrimination perspective? Well, first of all, uh, you mentioned the antibody testing. Uh, in Taiwan, we tend not to rely uh, solely or even primarily uh, on those, uh, specifically because the epidemiological dynamic between the antibody levels and the memory T cells uh, are not very well understood uh, at this point. Uh, yeah, and, and so uh, we basically um, rely on pretty much just RT-PCR, <laughs> but of course uh, augmented uh, with uh, so-called rapid tests uh, when RT-PCR is not feasible. Uh, but uh, we, I'm sorry? RT-PCR, can, can you spell that out? Uh, sure, uh, a RT-PCR um, is a, um, a testing of the real-time polymerase uh, chain reaction. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so so I mean I mean that's the the, the standard uh, the gold standard uh, of virus testing, uh, and we managed to uh, have active virus basically. That's right, and and we make uh, a lot of work with all the labs around Taiwan, so we can have on average just a few hours uh, turnaround, uh, and they work like well into the night, uh, in weekends and so on to to shorten uh, the time it takes. Uh, but what we have found is that um, really, the, of course, the, the kind of age groups or vulnerability groups, these are, I guess, is a little bit like measuring uh, um, whether you have a fever, like the, those thermometers. Of course, it, it works to a degree, but it also, uh, the false positive and negative uh, is too strong if you only rely on such uh, age groups or vulnerability groups, symptoms um, groups. And so um, usually we do not make uh, policies based on these, except for, for the long-term healthcare, but that's also to protect the healthcare workers, the, the nurses and doctors there. Uh, but otherwise, no, we don't discriminate uh, based on the age groups and so on. We uh, simply rely on RT-PCR for pretty much everything. And so if you have, are asymptomatic uh, and you're young and, and so on, uh, in Taiwan you have probably the same chance of getting discovered uh, and screened uh, as, as you would if you're a, a very elderly or even obese person. Yes, so, so about the antibodies uh, and the T cells, I, I agree completely, but that it's, it's not uh, clear. But, um, well, okay, so, sorry, I'm collecting my thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, my, my, my question is um, a strategy which allows the disease to go through society and relies on the elderly people to isolate, to self-isolate in order to, uh, for indefinite time or until there is a vaccine, basically. Uh, would you say that that's discriminatory against the, the elderly population? Well, I, I need more details uh, before I can answer that. I mean, when the first we introduced this uh, banning of visits to long-term health care. There was also some backlash, but then we explained that it's mostly to protect the frontline medical workers uh, who are important resource uh, to the country. Similarly, when there were uh, a case of a person uh, who initially uh, gets uh, confirmed uh, of a COVID positive, and during the first contact tracing interview, she said that she is living very simply at home, uh, hanging with uh, friends very rarely, and so everybody wondered why uh, in the medical uh, officer's team. But the very next day, she uh, confessed that uh, she is actually a professional working as a waitress in an intimate bar. Uh, and she initially uh, did not um, tell the contact tracer that because she was afraid that she would compromise the privacy of her clients in the intimate uh, drinking places. Uh, and so right afterward, uh, RCECC said, uh, until such a day uh, when the intimate bars and dancing clubs, nightclubs uh, can keep a safe physical distance 
assistance uh, and uh, instruct all their patrons to leave a real contact number in case an outbreak like this uh, occurs, um, then they will just have to shut down. Uh, but they, uh, they, they did shut down. I mean, the CCC did not impose any kind of criminal persecution, nor was there a, a large fine or anything. Basically, the CCC just said, uh, you have to understand the science behind it. You cannot operate uh, ignorant of the science. And at the time, there was also some backlash. People were saying uh, it's ridiculous for the CECC to say if they can keep a physical distance, the intimate bars are supposed to break uh, physical distance. That's the entire point of going to intimate bars and dancing clubs. Um, and, and, and so, um, of course, it was also uh, built as discrimination against certain professional workers. I mean, they are uh, professional workers. Uh, but however, um, after a few weeks, there's some uh, intimate boss that discovered that if they wear a cap uh, with plastic shielding, then you can see each other well, you can't kiss each other, I guess, but you can still drink uh, behind this plastic shield and keep a safe distance from one another. And they agreed uh, to have their patrons uh, write down their numbers on a physical paper and they check through SMS that these numbers are indeed the phone they are holding on their hand, but they can use a pseudonym. That is to say, they don't have to review their real name going into an intimate bar. And if there's no outbreak in that bar for four weeks, uh, then on a rotating basis, all those collected sheets of paper uh, uh, four weeks before are shredded so that uh, they would not be kept into permanent record. And after doing these measures, the municipalities gradually allow the intimate bars and dancing club to reopen. That is to say they are part of this uh, scientifically backed uh, new normal of the COVID uh, thing. But in the very beginning, uh, when this uh, challenge is issued and there was no feasible way of conforming to that in intimate boss, it does look like discrimination. So, so I guess it's a balancing act and uh, uh, innovation always comes from the civil society that has a firm understanding of the science involved. Yeah, and now we're, we're, we're getting a bit into the topic that I would love to talk about, but, but I guess uh, it, it will take too long, namely governance in general, smart mm -hmm. to uh, more interactive uh, mm -hmm. dialogue with government mm -hmm. and the people. But I, I uh -huh. guess maybe next time. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And if you're if you're interested uh, in uh, the measures that I just talked about, uh, I mean, the viewers, uh, you can check uh, Taiwan can help that us, which is this website uh, that a civil society, not the government of Taiwan have put together It's at Taiwan can help that us. And there's far more uh, written there as well as some YouTubers or uh, our vice president at the time, VP Chen Jianren, recording a crash course on epidemiology because he's uh, the vice president, but also literally the author of the textbook on epidemiology. Fantastic. This is great. Uh, one final question is, uh, so we're now heading towards autumn. We're still in the middle of summer, but uh, autumn is on, uh, on the horizon. Um, we still have a community spread in Sweden, but it is, it's way down. And uh, a vaccine is still not nearby, let's say. And it's believed, of course, when the colder temperature comes. Uh, in Sweden, we have, you know, summer and then winter and, and autumn in between. We mainly have autumn, to be honest. <laughs> it rains a lot. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, OK. Uh, so, so it's going to get cold and rainy uh, in a month or so. Um, what would your recommendation be for Sweden at this point in time, how to deal with this pandemic until, until the vaccine comes around? Um, so my main... Uh, idea, of course, uh, is that you should really wear a mask to protect you from your own unwashed hands. That really is the message that I want to get across. Thank you so much, Audrey Tang. Speaking mm -hmm. with you has been a great pleasure. Um, I, wonderful that you took the time to speak with me here in Sweden. Um, I wish you the best of luck in the Taiwanese people. Yes. Uh, Thank and, you. Uh, 
And uh, I wish you live long and prosper. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.